then hi everyone again uh well it's it's a pleasure to uh, to open this eighth amazonian workshop on gravity and analog models and let me again start by thanking the group there and Kishpin in particular for all the work that you've put together uh, in order to to have the workshop and hosting us um, as i've said before it's now been 10 years that we've started this collaboration between Avem and Belain. I, I think it's been a really synergetic in terms of science but also the basis of some great personal friendship so i hope it can continue for many years to come as i've said in my introduction and uh, today I'll be talking about the fate of the lightning instability based on this preprint that you see here, 2207-13713, which is almost accepted in PRL. I hope this, this will not jinx it. Uh, with Pedro Cunha, Eugene Radu, and Nicole Sanchez as well. And uh, besides hopefully passing on the message of my talk, I'll, I'll take it as an opportunity to advertise some of the lectures and talks uh, that you'll be hearing about uh, du during this workshop. Okay, so you should now see a slide change. Did you see it? Do you see a slide change? Just a moment, Carlos. Uh, I would ask you to uh, yeah. re uh, stop presenting and restart presenting. Uh, just a moment. Deixa só a tela dele, porque okay. quando ele entrar apresentando, vai ficar só a. a, a... A dele e a coisinha dele. Pega só, deixa ele lá, ele lá. Fixa nele, fixa no, no professor Carlos. Want me to stop planting? Uh, yes. Okay, I stop. Yes, yes. And now, and now. Just yeah, a moment. Yeah, just a moment. Fixa só ele. Deixa, deixa a gente sem aparecer, eu acho. E aí, quando ele entrar, vai entrar o quadro dele e ele no cantinho, certo, Jadir? Tu acha que é isso que vai acontecer? Assim, talvez? Assim vai ficar bom. Assim está aparecendo no canal e aqui é a nossa live. Ok, can you share your slides again? Carlos? Sure. Please. Yeah, I'll try to do it. So let me see. Ok. Ok. So now I will put on my slides. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can, can see, see we can see we're just trying to fix uh, the, the best way in which we can see your slides big so that we can follow uh, the details and the equations. No? Okay, Carlos, uh, please go on. Sorry, but please go on. Okay. So let me, uh, so uh, you should see a slide with just uh, the title and nothing else on it at the moment. Is that what you see? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So then let me tell you about my plan that I was telling you about. My plan is to start with some uh, background observations concerning the uh, black hole hypothesis, that is, that dark astrophysical compact objects are well described by the black hole solutions of general relativity, or some generalization thereof. I will then introduce a technique which is based on the concept of a topological charge and show you as an application that black holes under uh, some generic conditions always have light rings. And this is a topic that will be expanded on Pedro's lectures. Then I will consider the speculative idea that some uh, or all of the dark astrophysical compact objects are horizonless, ruled by some yet unestablished physics, and that I shall call the exotic compact object, or ECHO for short, hypothesis. And then applying the technique of the topological charge, I will argue that for ECHOs with a plausible formation mechanism, if they become sufficiently compact to have a light ring as to imitate some of the strong gravity phenomenology of black holes, then they must have a second one. And that one is fully stable unless the null energy condition is violated. So these stable light rings have been argued to trigger a space-time instability, and then I'll use a concrete echo model to test its fate, arguing it is there and it can be efficient in destroying echoes. And then I'll close with a discussion on the strengths and caveats of these analyses. 
Right, so um, without any further delay, let me start with these uh, generalities, with some generalities about black hole hypothesis and light rings. So um, the black hole hypothesis is, of course, supported by theory and not by observations. Let me do a very lightning review of the observational evidence for uh, black holes. Uh, the earliest evidence comes from the discovery of radio galaxies like Cygnus A in the 1930s, AGNs, and the discovery that uh, quasars are extragalactic objects in the 1960s. And the rationale is that black holes are extremely efficient at converting gravitational potential energy into radiation, which explains the large luminosities involved in these observations by invoking supermassive black holes. Another piece of evidence comes from X-ray sources interpreted as binaries, whence the X-ray emission comes from matter that's accreted and accelerated from a star towards an unseen companion around which uh, forms an accretion disk. The unseen companion must be very compact and it is interpreted as a stellar a mass black hole. The first and most famous such source is Cygnus X1 and that was found in the 1960s. Another piece of evidence comes from monitoring individual stars at the center of the Milky Way, where there's a compact radio source called Sagittarius A star. The star with the closest periaster to Sagittarius star is called S2. I think it still is. Well, there's some new candidates. Its orbit uh, shows there is a compact object with about 4 million solar masses. That's interpreted as a supermassive black hole. And as you probably know, for these observations, half of the 2020 Nobel Physics Prize was awarded to Andrea Guess and Reinhard Genzel. And I have to apologize to Roger Penrose for cutting him off here. Um, then another piece of evidence comes from the observations of gravitational wave transients by the LIGO Virgo and Alcagra collaboration um, of the 90 detections. Most are interpreted as black hole black hole mergers and seem to comply with the expectations of GR. I will say a bit more about gravitational waves later on. And of course, for the detection of gravitational waves, there was the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics to Vice Barry and Thorne back in 2017. And the last piece of evidence I want to invoke comes from the first images of black holes resolving horizon scale structure by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, which I'll also tell you more about later. And this again corroborate the expectation uh, from the black holes in general relativity. On the other hand, on the theory side, GR predicts black holes. Moreover, there's a series of uniqueness theorems established for vacuum and electrovacuum that suggest that all astrophysical black holes for all practical purposes could be well described by the current family of solutions of vacuum general relativity. So this more specific version of the black hole hypothesis is often called the Kerr hypothesis. It is beautifully summarized by Chandra Zecker in this quote. He owes at the remarkable possibility that the Kerr solution provides the absolutely exact representation of untold numbers of massive black holes that populate the universe. So testing the Kerr and black hole hypothesis is to keep some critical skepticism about the statement and ask questions such as, well, one, are these untold numbers of massive black holes exactly represented by the Kerr metric? Or two, are these black holes all of the same type? Or three, uh, are these objects really black holes? And uh, today, I want to focus on this third point and on the role of light rings. So let me now make the connection with light rings. For that, here's a nice image of the so-called shadow of a curved black hole uh, with the spin axis pointing upwards with uh, an idealized light source seen from the equatorial plate. Let us analyze it a bit for the curved solution as well as for a generic stationary and axisymmetric black hole solution, both in vacuum GR and beyond. One can associate the edge of the black hole shadow to a set of photon bound orbits, which we refer to as fundamental photon orbits. So in the Schwarzschild case, all of these are the familiar planar light rings. So light can circumnavigate a black hole uh, because of the extreme light bending. Here's a cartoon of the light ring orbit at R equals 3M in Schwarzschild and a spatial section of the horizon at R equals 2M. Um, the cartoon, this black region is the space-time trapped region, which is what defines a black hole. But the shadow is not the trapped region. Rather, it is a silhouette delimited by fundamental for the orbit. Let me illustrate this with the general Kerr case, but before, uh, let me comment that João Novo will tell you about a geometric perspective on extracting light rings and other special orbits from effective 2D metrics. 
So in the current case, the fundamental photon orbits are called spherical orbits since they have a constant boyer lindquist radial coordinate. They are not planar anymore. As they go around the black hole, they can explore a range of latitudes. So to illustrate this, I show in the top right panel the shadow of a curved black hole, which, as before, has spin axis pointing up, seen from the equatorial plane, uh, but now with a dimensionless spin parameter, which is only 82% of the maximum. These orbits are integrable, and one can associate to each a number of conserved quantities. Then each point of the shadow edge can be associated to a photon with a certain impact parameter, eta, and a Carter constant q. So one can identify the corresponding spherical orbit. Thus, the erect equatorial point on the shadow set corresponds to the counter-rotating light ring, uh, seen uh, in the left panel. Uh, the bottom right panel shows it has the largest perimetral radius, that's the dotted curve that you see there, and a vanishing angular amplitude in the latitudinal coordinate, theta, and that's the solid curve. Uh, these two symmetric points on the shadow's edge correspond to the green spherical orbit on the left panel, which does not reach the poles. These two symmetric points on the shadow's edge correspond to the blue spherical orbit on the left panel, which is the one spherical orbit that does reach the poles, and it has a zero impact parameter. Moving to positive impact parameters, these two symmetric points on the shadow's edge correspond to the red spherical orbit on the left panel, which again does not reach the poles. Until finally we get to the left equatorial point on the shadow's edge, corresponding to the co-rotating light ring, explicit in the left panel. So the bottom right panel uh, shows it has the smallest perimetral radius, that's the dotted curve, and again a vanishing angular amplitude in the latitudinal coordinate, theta, and that's the solid curve. Now, this sort of structure should be, in fact, rather universal, even for non-curved black hole models, where geodesic motion is not, not in that case, some new features can arise. And, uh, well, we have, well, uh, the evil saying was supposed to come uh, with us to, to, to Brazil, and he was supposed to talk about a particular example where that happens. Unfortunately, due to the very bad work of the Portuguese uh, border services, he could not come. But anyway, um, so, uh, well, a couple of years ago, to make this point clear of some generality, um, together with Pedro, we proved a theorem that establishes that a stationary, uh, axisymmetric, asymptotically flat black hole in one plus three dimensions with a non-extremal, topologically spherical killing horizon admits at least one standard light ring outside the horizon for each rotation sense. The proof uses no field equations and therefore is valid in generic theories of gravity. The theorem is based on a topological charge, which is going to be important in our discussion, and I will now introduce it. Uh, but doing so, I will advertise also Pedro's uh, lectures, which will go in much more detail on, on his course, in his course explaining these topological theorems. So the central idea uh, is that light rings are critical points of a potential. The uh, null geodesics uh, flow on a stationary axisymmetric spacetime, assuming circularity, that's an assumption here, is ruled by this Hamiltonian that can be split into a kinetic part corresponding to the non killing directions and a potential part, which is the killing directions. This potential U can be factorized using the conserved quantities energy E and angular momentum L associated to the killing symmetries. And this introduces two effective potentials, which I'm calling H plus minus here. So that, that was very fast, therefore, which doesn't really matter. So uh, that's why it was fast. Um, well, uh, it does matter, but not here. The important thing is that the light rings are critical points of these potentials. Now, one can associate the topological charge to the light rings. And let me illustrate this for the Schwarzschild black hole. Here are the two potentials for Schwarzschild. Uh, they only differ by a sign, as in any spherical solution. One can then define a vector field as the gradient of each of these potentials. So for Schwarzschild, um, here is the representation of one of these vector fields in the R theta space. That's the non-killing space. This is the space outside the black hole with the horizon towards the left, spatial infinity towards the right, and the top and bottom uh, being the symmetry axis, t equals 0 and pi. The light ring is this point at r equals 3 and on the equatorial plane. 
You can now imagine doing an arbitrary contour C that encloses the light ring. Consider the circulation of this vector field as you travel, say, anti-clockwise around the contour. So here it is. What you can see is that an anti-clockwise circulation of E around C gives a non-trivial clockwise winding. So I'll show you again. And uh, this attributes a topological charge, uh, omega equals minus one to the light ring because the winding opposes the circulation. It does not matter what is the shape of the contour, as long as it encloses the light ring. The result is the same. On the other hand, if you consider any contour C' prime that does not enclose the light ring, you can observe that the winding number of the vector field as it circulates around C' prime is zero. What you can see, uh, well, in this case, is that it kind of starts to wind and then it just one winds. So the winding number of V circulating around C prime is omega equal to zero. In this pictorial description of the topological charge, you can observe that only the direction of the vector field is relevant. So we can normalize it as in this figure here. Now all the arrows have the same size. Now mathematically, the topological charge is defined via the integral the angle of the vector field, here called capital omega, makes with some reference direction as it circulates around the closed contour, which must be a multiple of 2 pi, since the contour is closed, and the multiplicity is the topological charge, omega. But not all light rings have topological charge, omega equals minus 1. So light rings are critical points of the H plus minus potentials. A critical point can be a saddle point, a local minimum, or a local maximum. Standard light rings, like the ones in Schwarzschild curve, are actually saddle points. For instance, in Schwarzschild, the light ring is unstable in the radial direction, but it is actually stable in the theta direction. They always have a topological charge omega equals minus one. Exotic light rings, on the other hand, which are unlike the ones in Schwarzschild curve, are local minima or maxima they turn out to have a topological charge omega equals plus one. Moreover, it is easy to show that the topological charge is additive. That is, if the contour encloses more than one light ring, then the contour integral is determined by the sum of individual light ring charges, which can be minus one or plus one. So here's an example. This is not a black hole. It is actually an exotic compact object, actually a boson star which possesses two light rings, an exotic one and a standard one. So the former is within the contour C1, and uh, you can see that it uh, has omega equals plus one. So if you just follow it with your finger, you can see if you go clockwise, it winds clockwise. If you go anticlockwise, it winds anticlockwise. And uh, then the, uh, the standard light ring is within contour C2, and it has omega equals minus one, as we have seen. So you can also see that going around the overall contour C3, the winding number is zero, which is of course zero equals plus one minus one. So then to establish the theorem, we look at the contour C that in the limit encloses the whole space outside the horizon of the black hole. Imposing carefully boundary conditions, one shows that the total topological charge is omega equals minus one. This does not use any field equations, just the boundary conditions of having an asymptotically flat, black hole spacetime, regular on and outside the horizon, with the stated assumptions on the black hole. And this means that black holes must have at least one standard light ring. This works for each of the H plus minus potentials, meaning roughly for each rotation set. But this does not exclude black holes could have more than one light ring. If so, uh, extra light rings must come in pairs one being exotic and the other an extra standard one, as to keep the total topological charge to be minus one. In fact, there are known examples of black holes with these extra light rings, and this is precisely what Ivo uh, could tell you about if he would have come, but he didn't, so, well, that's it. 
Um, I would like to remark that if you change the boundary conditions, the total topological charge can be different, and I believe Harold will tell you about one such example. Now, the reason I've been talking about light rings is that they are closely connected to some of the strong gravity phenomenology of black holes and therefore to their observational evidence. I've already mentioned black hole shadows and this very academic image. Real life is, is rather more difficult, unfortunately. So um, in an astrophysical scenario, radiation in the vicinity of a black hole comes from synchrotron radiation from an accretion disk or some astrophysical environment. And to model that, synthetic images are generated by GRMHD simulations using, say, the Kerr metric as a background. So um, this image is from one such simulation, and its, its distinctive feature is the bright emission ring. Since we know the background metric, this feature can be interpreted, and it is essentially a lens image of the black hole light ring. Then applying a Gaussian blurry filter to the synthetic image to mimic real EHT observations, well, namely this fact that VHD baselines do not provide a dense coverage of the so-called complex visibilities in Fourier space. Um, but obtains a synthetic blurred image, that's the one on the right, quite similar to the real data, that's the one on the left. And this illustrates the observation is consistent with a curved black hole to this level of consistency, and that this emission uh, ring is intimately connected to the light ring. Light rings also play a role on gravitational wave observations. For the events where one can see the merge, a part of the signal is the ring down. It turns out that the ring down has a close connection to light rings. And uh, this can be seen in the iconal approximation, where it can be shown that for spherical black holes, the real part of the frequency of quasi-normal modes is associated to the frequency of null geodesics traveling on the light ring. That's this capital omega C. Whereas the imaginary part is associated to the Lyapunov exponent, this lambda, which is measuring the stability of the orbit. The connection for general black holes is more complicated, and I, I think it's still under discussion. Nonetheless, this connection between ring down and light rings was used to hypothesize that horizonless ultra-compact echoes, where here ultra-compact means they have similar light rings to black holes, could vibrate similarly to black holes when perturbed, at least initially, even though some echoes of the signal, and here echoes is with an H, um, should in general be present if there is no fully absorbing event horizon. And this leads us to the echo hypothesis. Echoes have the appeal that they could avoid the singularity problem and perhaps connect to another fundamental problem of modern physics, that of dark matter. And uh, Lorenzo will tell you more about bosonic dark matter in his course. Actually, uh, many echo models, and not necessarily with light rings, have been proposed throughout the years in different guises, sometimes also with different motivations, and not always to replace black holes. Some compromise, introducing new players that could coexist with black holes. Now, if um, any of these or other models should be taken seriously in the long run, announce the two questions. Can they explain the observations? And are they good theoretically? Many of these models are admittedly very exotic, but so were black holes ones. I've listed here a bunch of examples, but ideally we would like to make general statements about these objects. So let me show you one such general statement. So some time ago, together with Pedro and Emanuele Berti, we got another theorem that applies very generically to ultra-compact echoes that can form from smooth initial data on Minkowski spacetime through an incomplete gravitational collapse, which means no horizon form. Actually, this was the first go at these topological theorems, and the other one was the second. Now, this theorem states that axisymmetric stationary solutions of the Einstein field equations formed from classical gravitational collapse, obeying the null energy condition that are everywhere smooth and ultra compact, must have at least two light rings, and one of them is stable. In fact, the theorem applies more generically than in general relativity, as I will explain. And the, the proof of the theorem is again based on the topological charge. The idea is exactly the same as in the black hole case, but now instead of a horizon boundary condition, one has a regular origin boundary condition. 
This actually changes the direction of the vector field at that end and implies that now the topological charge must be zero. The result only depends on boundary conditions and smoothness up to this point. No field equations were assumed. It applies obviously to flat spacetime. And um, as a corollary, um, we have that for any ultra compact echo that is smoothly deformable into flat spacetime, light rings, if they are present, come in pairs with one exotic and another standard one forming together. So the nice thing is that this can be converted into a dynamical picture. If one starts with dilute initial data, meaning it's not deforming very much Minkowski spacetime, think about a regular star. By regular star, I mean something like the sun, just made up of whatever material this would be. Um, so there are no light rings, and hence the total topological charge is zero. Whatever happens in the dynamical collapse, it is not so important as long as it is smooth. No topological changes, no topology changes are allowed. We then assume that the final stage, which is an equilibrium, horizonless, ultra-compact echo, is stationary and axisymmetric. Then its topological charge must be zero. And this is clear because one could connect the final ultra-compact echo to flat spacetime by an off-shell sequence of smoothly deformed spacetimes where the topological charge could be defined all along in a kind of an adiabatic process. Note that, of course, the true dynamical process, uh, which is not stationary, needs not be axisymmetric, as expected in a realistic process. And then the punchline is that any stationary axisymmetric circular topologically trivial echo that forms from an incomplete gravitational cloud, which has a standard light ring, must have an exotic one as well, it now remains still to clarify the type of the exotic one. We can consider then for that study the null vector PMU that is tangent to the exotic light ring. Under our assumptions for the metric, we can show in full generality that at the light ring, the Einstein tensor contracted with this null vector twice is the Laplacian in the R theta space of the potential that determines the light ring. You could take this potential U as well. Then, assuming now, for the first time, the Einstein field equations, a similar statement holds in terms of the energy momentum tensor. It follows that if the light ring is a local maximum of U, then the null energy condition is violated. Conversely, if one imposes the null energy condition, the exotic one must be fully stable. Let me remark that in modified gravity, one may proceed similarly in terms of an effective energy momentum tensor. And this is what I meant by saying that it, the theorem could apply more generically than in just GR. So, and this leads us to the um, uh, light ring uh, instability. Well, and perhaps, just perhaps, this is where the crack is. So it was suggested that a stable light ring could trigger a space-time instability. Well, it's an intuitive picture that a potential well for null perturbations may lead them to pile up so that eventually they will deform space-time. The issue is how any relaxation mechanism competes with this piling up. This was investigated by Joe Kerr, who used a toy model to suggest that the relaxation mechanism is not efficient. So individual modes can decay, but not sufficiently fast. And then the instability trigger, if this is true, is nonlinear. That is, it's not caused by a single growing mode. It's the piling up that eventually leads to a non-trivial back reaction. Well, in any case, this would mean that one cannot check the instability by a perturbative analysis. Moreover, and crucially, these arguments tell us absolutely nothing about the time scale of the instability. If the instability is present, but it takes too long to develop, it could be harmless in practice. So at this point, we can only say that the existence of a stable light ring is a potentially generic obstruction for any ultra compact uh, echo that can form from classical GR dynamics with exotic, but still decent matter. 
Of course, if one agrees to violate the null energy condition, one needs not have the stable Leipzig. But then Penrose's theorem doesn't follow either, and one needs not have singularities inside black holes. So uh, for quite a few years, we were looking for a good testing ground for this putative light ring instability. A good testing ground would be an echo model that one is free of other instabilities, example, perturbative instabilities or an ergo region instability, as to isolate the light ring instability as the only possible issue. And two, the echo model should be dynamically robust and thus prone to nonlinear evolutions. Luckily, there is one such good family of echo models around, and these are bosonic stars. So bosonic stars are lumps of bosonic fields, um, scalar or vector, self-gravitating, that can be quite compact and thus become interesting black hole mimickers. And uh, you will hear much more about bosonic stars and also black holes that can get in equilibrium with these bosonic stars in the talks by Juan Carlos and Nuno Santos and the course by Eugene Rudd. So here are some facts about bosonic stars set against a checklist of theoretical criteria that any reasonable echo model or even a non pure black hole model should, should obey. First, bosonic stars appear in well-motivated and consistent physical models, GR minimally coupled to massive bosonic fields, scalar or vector, which need not have but can have self-interactions. So it's GR with some decent matter. Second, bosonic stars have a dynamical formation mechanism, which is gravitational cooling. And finally, bosonic stars are stable against perturbative instabilities in some models and some regions of the parameter space. This does not mean issues are absent. We are still discovering, as we go along, subtle problems in some models. For instance, three years ago, we found that scalar, rotating, mini balls and stars are unstable. And I will say more about this. As another example, more recently, it was found that the initial value problem can become ill-defined for self-interacting protofields. So, for some time, as I've said, we were looking for bosonic star models where light rings emerge and no other instabilities are present. But this was not so easy. The simplest spherical models don't work. The simplest um, the spherical models um, uh, are determined, uh, as in general, bosonic star models, by a frequency parameter, omega. This is the star's mass in the vertical versus horizontal uh, in the horizontal the frequency plot for uh, the simplest models. Um, consider the red curves, that's the mass. The left panel is for the scalar case and the right panel is for the vector case. It's well known that the stable branch occurs between the Newtonian limit and the maximum of the ADM mass. So this is the maximum of the ADM mass, and these are the stable branches. This is suggested by generic so-called turning point arguments that imply that bosonic stars change their stability when an extremum of the mass as a function of an appropriate parameter is achieved. But for the spherical stars, this has been confirmed by explicit perturbative computations. On the other hand, light rings only merge well within the unstable branches. Actually, in the third branch, in the scalar case, and the fourth branch for the Broca case, and the inset shows a zoom of these branches. And the uh, picture that light rings only emerge well within the unstable branches in spherical bosonic stars seems to be more gen uh, general, even in models with self-interactions, as we have seen in this paper quoted uh, at the bottom of the slide. And here uh, I'm showing you what actually happens to these ultra-compact spherical bosonic stars without self-interactions, uh, evolving them using uh, numerical relativity techniques, even in spherical symmetry, just within the perturbations that are seeded by numerical truncation error, they collapse to black holes just within a few tens of light crossing times. You can see the apparent horizon mass increasing and the bosonic field energy decreasing in these plots for the scalar, that's the left panel and the vector, right panel, the dynamics is very similar. But let me remark, one cannot attribute this collapse to the light rings since solutions in the unstable branch uh, without light rings can also collapse similarly to black holes. And by the way, light rings 
uh, do emerge in pairs in all of these models and others of bosonic stars in accordance to the theorem. So we started looking for our testing ground for the lightning instability using spinning bosonic stars. However, we had found in 2019 that the most fundamental spinning scalar bosonic stars without any self-interactions develop a non-axisymmetric instability at the moderately long time scale of the order of a thousand light crossing times. So you can see it uh, in this uh, visualization of one of these uh, fully nonlinear evolutions of the einstein klein gordon system in the left panel. So here the color code denotes the, 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 the scalar field amplitude. So I'll put it again for you to see. When the non axisymmetric instability kicks in, an apparent horizon forms, as you can see in the right panel, where the mass associated to this apparent horizon is the blue solid line, and the energy associated with the scalar field is the green dashed line, uh, which tends to vanish as it is swallowed by, by the black hole. And this is signaling black hole formation. So these stars collapse to, to a black hole. And this has nothing to do with light rings, as these stars are not ultra compact. By the way, this instability occurs where, by turning point arguments, one would expect a stable branch of solutions, showing these arguments are indicative only. However, the instability was not seen in the cousin Proca model. At least this is what could be deduced from numerical evolutions with a time scale 10 times larger than the ones where the scalar instability was seen. So at the time we suggested the difference in dynamical stability could be associated to this different morphology of the stars, the scalar stars are toroidal, whereas the vector stars are spheroidal. There is an analogy with models of rotating neutron stars where toroidal uh, solutions are also possible, but suffer in general, a similar instability. Likely things are more complicated though, but well, that was our guideline at the time. Um, we then started to understand that this non axisymmetric instability uh, in the scalar case could be mitigated by adding self interactions in this work here. And then this work by Easton Simonson suggested that instability of the scalar stars could actually be completely quenched by appropriate self interactions. So this led us to identify some appropriate models for testing the light ring instability. Okay, for concreteness, let me show you a couple of Lagrangians. One is a scalar model with self-interactions, often called solitonic model. It contains two disconnected branches that, by generic turning point arguments, uh, are potentially stable. Um, one of which corresponds to quite compact solutions called the relativistic stable branch. Another is a vector model, also known as the Proca model, without self-interactions, which, as I've already mentioned, exhibited no noticeable instabilities in previous analysis. And by the way, the construction of this type of solutions will be discussed uh, in George Delgado's lectures. This overall picture is summarized in this plot showing the solution space for both models. Now, consider first the inset, which shows the domain of existence of the solitonic model. This uh, potentially relativistic stable branch against a perturbative instability is from the local minimum here until the absolute maximum here. This is just based on generic turning point arguments. What Simonson and his check is that some of the solutions at the bottom of this prime still suffer from a non-axisymmetric instability, but that shuts off for solutions below the frequency of 0 0.493, which is around here. So the evidence is that from this point down in frequency to the maximal mass, we have a relativistic stable branch. The first solution with light rings is where the pink diamond sits. Then the dashed line would be the set of ultra compact boson stars within this putative stable branch. Importantly, an ergo region only appears at this blue star. So the ultra compact stars along the dashed line are free from an ergo region instability. A very analogous picture holds for the Proca model. This is now the main panel. Again, the first solution with light rings is where the pink diamond sits. And the dashed line is the set of ultra compact Proca stars within the stable branch. 
This is against linear perturbations. This set is now terminated by the emergence of the ergo region appearing at the blue star. So the two sets of solutions corresponding to these dashed lines are our testing ground for the light ring instability. For reference, I've put here the frequency interval for the dashed lines. Now we perform polynomial numerical relativity evolutions using these stars in these intervals as initial data, as well as some outside for benchmarking. This uses the machinery of numerical relativity that we developed in previous works, namely this paper that you see here. And this plot, we show the time scale of the instability versus the frequency. And you can all already see there is an instability. So um, to benchmark, let us first analyze a non-ultra compact solution. So that's a Proca star without light rings with a frequency 0 0.72. So, uh, so uh, uh, beyond the, or before the ultra compact regime. So the evolution of such non-ultra compact spinning Proca star with a frequency 0 0.72 is seen in this movie. It shows the energy. It shows the energy density of the star with the color scale that you can see here. The evolution shows some small well, I guess this is typical of numerical evolutions, but no evidence of instability. And note that at the edge, the oscillations look uh, large, but notice the scale. There's a log scale here. They are very, very small numbers. Moreover, the oscillations, and this is the key test, go away, increasing the resolution and uh, also the grid size. If we now move to the ultra compact regime, the picture changes. We have done this for various solutions, but I will just show you an illustrative case, and that is with the, the frequency 07, 068, where that star sits. Then, uh, at a time in this case of the order of 800, the star develops an instability that first mildly, and at times more notoriously, destroys its axis symmetry. So I'll show this again. The star is losing part of its energy and angular momentum, as I will show you, and mostly carried by ejected proton field, very little by gravitational waves. And again, it also suffers a kick, in moving away from the grid center. In fact, the star seems to be pushed around, a bit like a full balloon which is emptying its air. I'll come back to this, but let us first analyze the scalar case. For frequencies greater than 0 0.188 inside this uh, relativistic stable branch, but in the vicinity of the ultra compact stars, we do not see any stability or development. Actually, Simonson and East did that also for precisely this model and the frequency of 0 0.303 uh, and reported no sign of instability when they developing, uh, they were evolving for up to a time of about uh, 7,000 in units of mass. So um, in the interval under consideration, on the other hand, we always see collapse into a black hole. So here's the case with frequency uh, 0 0.16. Here I'm showing you in this movie the evolution of the star. And uh, so first one sees a breakdown of axis symmetry, and then the star simply disappears. As it disappears, we can find an apparent horizon showing black hole formation. This is diagnosed by the minimum of the lapse, this uh, function n, which goes to zero at horizon formation. Here you can see also the time evolution of the scalar field energy, E phi, and of the black hole mass, MBH. So the scalar field energy is essentially absorbed uh, by the black hole. So at this point, we were pretty confident about two conclusions. First, the light ring instability occurs the examples we studied uh, show a clear transition in the behavior between the solutions with and without light rings along what could be expected to be a set of solutions with similar stability properties. Even if previous results show that there is a non axisymmetric instability in the scalar case for sufficiently high frequencies along that branch, I will argue later, this is different in nature to what is occurring for the ultra compact solutions. Second, its time scale is astrophysically short, except if close to the critical solution. Moreover, the fate of the light ring instability for the solitonic scalar stars was also clear. They collapse to a black hole. 
But it remained to clarify what was the fate in the Proca case. I will now argue that it is a migration towards non auto compact solutions. The first piece of evidence is that time evolution of the mass and angular momentum here shown for four spinning Proca stars. Um, so three of them here have light rings. Those are the ones with 068, 069, and 070 frequencies, that is. And one does not have light rings. That's the one with frequency 072. The mass and angular momentum of the critical model separating ultra compact from non ultra compact solutions is given by the solid and dashed black line respectively so so here they are the models with light rings suffer an important loss of angular momentum when the stability kicks in with strong oscillations as you can see say in the top red line Afterwards, they lose angular momentum and mass at the slower rate, tending towards values corresponding to configurations without light rings. On the other hand, as expected, the model with omega equals 0 to does not show any instability. But we wanted to see this migration more from the viewpoint of light rings. So to show you a second piece of evidence, in our paper, we introduced a technique called an adiabatic effective potential. This allows introducing an effective potential for dull geodesics even in an evolving spacetime, as long as the evolution is sufficiently slow and the deviations from axis symmetry are mild. Here you see that effective potential given by the solid red line. So this is going to be a movie. So you'll see the, uh, the solid red line evolving. And this will be the evolution of that focus star that I've shown you with frequency 068, the one that was moving around. The maximum in this uh, uh, red line, solid red line, is the standard light ring, and the minimum is the exotic one. Simultaneously, in this plot, you see the corresponding effective potential for null geodesics for a sequence of stationary solutions. So these are the dashed lines one to five. All of these are ultra compact solutions have light rings and uh, this correspond again to the extreme of the potential and in this sequence as uh, we approach one we are approaching the non-ultra compact solution as time evolves you will see the adiabatic potential is, is oscillating sometimes violently so we also average it over the oscillation period of the labs and this is taken to represent the physical oscillations of the evolving star. And that will be the dashed red line that you will also see moving around. So here's the evolution. So after some initial uh, uh, adaptation uh, of the code, so there is no instability. And at some point, the instability kicks in. So the, the star starts to oscillate. Um, and um, this uh, dramatic effective potential it dips sometimes violently, the average one less so, and there is an initial strong evolution, but then a clear a trendy evolution starts to take over. In particular, you can see that the average adiabatic effective potential is moving clearly towards the non-ultra compact solutions, but very close to them, meaning that the, uh, the adiabatic approximation seems to be a good one. So notice that one of the difficulties here is that the star was moving around. So you cannot define this with respect to the center of the grid, but it has to be defined with respect to the center of the star. The question was, well, it's going in where we think it will be going, but will it get there in finite time? Or is it simply a process that will take forever? And uh, as you will see, it will approach in this, in this video, in this plot, very close to one. And you cannot really tell the difference, but if you look carefully, you will see that the maximum is going to be a bit below and the minimum a bit above, and actually it ceases to have extrema. But it might cease to have, but because it's oscillating, it might create them again, and then it loses them again, and it's kind of a, a process that might have several generations. So the solution went until here, and uh, we can see this a bit more quantitatively here. This is the evolution of the light ring circumferential radius computed from the adiabatic average potential. So that's in red. So the blue line is a spline interpolation just to help see the pattern. And one clearly sees that the light rings converge. In other words, there's a migration towards a non-ultra-compact broken star. 
Now, an obvious question is why? Why the difference in the outcome between the scalar and vector case? I'll give you here an argument, but likely things are more complicated than just the argument I'm going to give you here. Well, uh, the observation relates to the compactness. And you can see here the compactness. The scalar stars we have analyzed are more compact than the vector ones. For instance, the scalar star I showed you collapsed into a black hole with frequency 016 has compactness uh, 033. Whereas the vector star that I showed you migrate with a frequency 068 has a compactness 090. And another important question that I promise to come back to is if the two non-axisymmetric instabilities in the scalar relativistic stable branch stable are different. Well, we think they are. And this is related to energetics. So here I'm showing you again the domain of existence of the scalar solitonic stars, highlighting not only the ultra compact stars, which is the black dashed line, I've shown you this before, where we have seen the stars collapse, but also the region where one also sees a non axisymmetric instability as a blue dashed line. There are several differences. The first is the outcome. Whereas the ultra compact stars collapse into a black hole, as I've shown you, for the solutions in the dashed blue line, Simmons and Anist show the outcome was a fragmentation into two non spinning uh, boson stars that are ejected at high speeds. They suggest that this outcome is related to energetics. So, along this blue dashed line, it is energetically favored for the spinning star to decay into two non-spinning stars with half the noether charge of the former, of the spinning star, each. This is not the case for the ultra-compact stars. They are not energetically unstable in this sense. Additionally, the strength of the ultra-compact instability roughly increases with the decreasing omega, whereas it decreases with decreasing omega for the, the fragmentation instability. So, Despite both having this non axisymmetric instability, evidence supports uh, the two instabilities have a different source and a different outcome. So let me conclude and give you some final thoughts. So can there be ultra compact echoes? Well, uh, it seems hard, at least within GR. The light ring instability is real and it needs not be too long lived, except near the critical solution where the phenomenology, well, I'm not sure it can mimic a black hole, that's an interesting question, um, and leading at least to collapse or, or migration. And this questions, to some extent, the plausibility in general of these ultra-compact echoes uh, that have a plausible formation mechanism within GR and within the set of assumptions that we've used. I want to add that objects like wormholes or gravistars, for which formation must likely invoke some sort of quantum mechanism, evade our conclusion. And uh, uh, Carolina and Rafael will talk about wormholes and quantum effects tomorrow, I believe. But uh, there, you can say, as, as kind of uh, caveats, uh, these are just a couple of families of examples. It's true. Are we missing some generality? Well, perhaps. But there are some details in the analysis for which a deeper understanding would be nice. And, um, well, there's some there, but there's more. One can also ask if there are reasonable ultra-compact echoes without a stable light ring, uh, dropping some of the assumptions. And some of the assumptions are also there. That's an interesting question. And even the extent to which echoes can mimic black holes if they are not ultra-compact. And that's also an interesting question. And there are interesting examples. So, uh, with this, I will land. But before, I would like to tell you that besides all the talks I've already mentioned, do not miss also the remaining talks by Marco Aurelio and Zeus on Tuesday and Wednesday on scattering and radiation emission. This way, I believe I did not miss any talk on the scientific program. Hopefully not. If so, I apologize. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I conclude. So we thank you, Carlos.